Good evening, everyone. Hope you've all, uh, you're all all having a great summer. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'm thrilled that you could be here as we welcome Booth alum Gus Souter, formerly of Vanguard, currently CEO at uh, social media startup Brandon Power, to today's Distinguished Speaker Series event. Uh, this The DSS series, of course, is a long-standing Booth tradition. We bring high-profile leaders from business, from the government, from the community, to come to this forum to share their insights and experience. Um, and I would say the virtual DSS is something uh, that will stand out as a positive of what we learned during COVID. So we switched to these virtual series at the beginning of uh, the pandemic. And in the beginning, we were trying to figure out how are alumni and their companies dealing with COVID. Uh, but the series was such a big hit and we've been able to reach so many people through it. Uh, so we've continued it in the virtual format the last couple of years. We've had lots of great leaders come on, uh, Tom Ricketts, Jenny Scanlon, uh, JP Gunn, and Mukherjee, Jose Antonio Alvarez from Santander, just a whole host of people from all over the world. And it's wonderful to be able to uh, introduce today's distinguished speaker, uh, who many of you probably know or have heard of. So Gus, uh, George Sauter, we call him Gus, serves as CEO, a CEO at Random Power, which is a startup in the social media space centered around college athletes and their financial needs. Uh, prior to that, Gus spent uh, 25 years at the Vanguard. He was their first global chief investment officer, uh, retired from that role at the end of 2012. And as CIO at Vanguard, he was a member of the CEO senior staff, and he oversaw portfolio management of uh, about $1.7 trillion of internally managed stock, bond, and money market funds was also a member of the investment committee that oversaw the portfolio management for the external advisors that uh, Vanguard uses. Uh, in addition to the stuff he has done with, uh, with uh, Vanguard, Gus had a huge impact uh, on the industry. Uh, he worked on industry issues with uh, the SEC, the Federal Reserve, he's testified to Congress. Uh, he's also been on lots of industry committees, the uh, ICI's trading committee, uh, the NICE Institutional Advisors Trading Committee, NASDAQ quality of markets. Uh, he was on the PCAOB investor advisor group and many, many other things. Currently, Gus is CEO of a startup, uh, which we'll speak about. And he's also on six investment committees, including an endowment, an investment advisor, uh, an Australian retirement fund, uh, FINRA, and the PGA of America, which we'll be sure to talk to Gus more about. Uh, he's a former member of the Booth Advisory Council writes articles for the Wall Street Journal uh, online edition as a member of the experts panel. And earlier this year, we honored Gus with the Chicago Booth Distinguished Alumni Award in the uh, corporate category. Uh, Gus, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Mara. I'm uh, happy to have the opportunity. So we have uh, lots of topics we can chat about, but maybe we could just start by asking you to say a little bit about your career journey. Was this all planned out? How did it, how did it sort of work out? <laughs> Uh, you, you know, virtually nothing was planned. Um, I, I, after going to uh, Chicago, I started working for a local real estate firm. It was a national firm uh, headquartered in Chicago, LaSalle Partners. I uh, worked there for a couple of years and uh, then moved on from there. And, and I had a good friend from uh, my days at Chicago, a uh, good friend, uh, Chris Dialinus, who was working at PIMCO at the time. And he kept telling me that I needed to get into the investment business. And it was a uh, really in the love of my life anyways. And I hadn't, um, um, hadn't really pursued that direction, but he talked me into it. He was thinking I might come out to uh, Newport Beach and uh, join him at PIMCO. Um, but, but who wants to move to Newport Beach? I decided I'd move to Ohio and uh, try to get into the investment business. And uh, so I ended up working for a regional bank in Ohio um, and uh, worked there for a couple of years. And, and I had a good friend at, uh, in college at, at Dartmouth who was actually at the time almost, he was soon to become the president of, of Vanguard. And uh, so he talked me into going out to Vanguard, which turned out to be a great opportunity. I, I started off uh, running the very small uh, equity group, which consisted of basically one index fund. I was hired to, to both develop the index fund and also the active quant funds as well. And, and then, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, I served on the investment committee overseeing the external managers. We had about 35 different external managers. And um, I, I had an opportunity to, to be on uh, our CEO's senior staff my last 15 years at, at Vanguard. 
And, um, and then, as you mentioned, I became CIO my last 12 years. We, we never had a CIO before. I was running the equity department and the head of the fixed income retired. And so I got fixed income as well. And, uh, and then I retired about a decade ago. And as you mentioned, I've been doing a lot of uh, work on investment committees. And, and recently I was pulled back into the workforce by a friend that I met through the, uh, the Dean's Council um, at, the, at the graduate school. And, uh, and so now we're uh, co-founders of this uh, new firm that we're trying to get off the ground. We're still, still haven't launched yet, but uh, that's, that's the nutshell version. Right. Uh, so to the audience, I wanted to say, as always, the more interactive we make it, the better. So I have a bunch of questions that many of the registrants sent in advance, uh, but feel free to put in stuff in the Q&A box and I'll sort of weave them into the discussion with Gus. So again, please feel free to send in questions uh, and, and I'll, I'll sort of take them as they come. Um, so one of the things I wanted to chat with you, uh, something our, our uh, alumni and students always want to know, uh, Gus, is like, how did your time at uh, Chicago influence your career and sort of the arc that you had afterward? Well, I, I loved my my time there. Um, it was um, it was a great opportunity for me. I love the the academics and the investment side. You know, finance obviously has always been a hallmark of, of the University of Chicago. So it was a great uh, great learning experience for me, and it did prepare me for my ultimate career that I should have gotten into to begin with. Uh, you know, investing. Um, I, uh, one of the jobs I mentioned that I had at the regional bank in Ohio. Uh, I, I sent letters to every money manager in the state of Ohio, and, and which there's not a big, big list. But I got a, a call from the uh, the head of of trust department at a regional bank, and he said, "Well, we don't really have any jobs, but I see that you went to the University of Chicago and, and have your MBA from there." He said, "So you know, I'd love to just have a cup of coffee with you." And so I said, "Sure, I'll be up tomorrow." And and uh, um, talked to him, and the next day he said, "You know, we'd like to extend an offer to you." But it was only because I went to U Chicago that he even gave me a cup of coffee. Uh, and then, uh, but I felt that Chicago had really prepared me for that uh, opportunity. And then the same thing when I got to go to Vanguard, it was because I had been developing a quantitative uh, money management model at the bank, and Vanguard wanted to develop uh, active quant capabilities. Uh, within Vanguard and at the same time build the the index side. The indexing is basically passive quant. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I'd say that U Chicago prepared me for really um, every step of, of my career uh, post the, the Chicago days. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, uh, also it created a network um, of alums and classmates that uh, I've kept in touch with. And, uh, and that's also helped me throughout my career. Uh, so one of the things that some uh, some of those may not know is that Gus is uh, the reason that we have CRISP at Chicago, the Center for Research and Security Prices, um, become sort of an indexer. And many of you may not know, you know, several of the Vanguard domestic equity funds are tied to indexes that we maintain at Chicago Booth. And I think the dollar amounts of the, the those that we actually oversee are staggering. And we owe that all to Gus. So maybe Gus, you could just speak about what, what was sort of the issue going on uh, when you were CIO at Vanguard, what problem were you trying to solve and why did you think about Chicago Booth as the place to come to for that? So there are a number of index providers, you know, there and, and you know, there are uh, five or six or seven, they're really uh, high quality index providers. And, uh, but they, uh, while creating an index, there's a lot of moving, uh, uh, blocking and tackling that you have to do, but there's not that much different from one index to the to the next. Yet everybody wanted premium pricing. We had to uh, pay royalties in order to use an index, and those royalties were staggering. I mean, uh, in the, the nine digit range. So uh, you know, we looked at it and said we can create indexes ourselves. And, you know, and again, it, it it's not easy, but if you do the blocking and tackling right, you can get it done. And we thought, well, you know, should we be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to use various index providers, indexes, or should we figure out a different strategy? And so we had our, in our back pocket was, if we need to, we'll create our own. But at the same time, I really didn't want to go that route because uh, I think there's an advantage to have a third party provider. It just seems a little odd if you're tracking your own indexes. 
So, um, uh, you know, I, I thought of various entities and, and we approached a few. And, um, you know, since Chris uh, had been at Chicago for forever and had, you know, the, the security data going back to, I guess, uh, 1926 or something, it seemed like time started in 1926. <laughs> um, you know, it seemed like, well, Chris would be a natural for us to approach. And, and I happened to be on the Dean's Council at the time with Ted Snyder. And so I, I spoke with Ted and, uh, and he was interested in the opportunity and, and we decided to go ahead and, and work together and um, work something that worked for the school uh, without being overly uh, expensive for us. I mean, I think it was fair for both, both parties involved. Mm -hmm. And how would you say that has worked out from Vanguard's standpoint? It, it's been great. You know, as, as expected, the indexes are high quality. Uh, Lubash Pasteur and John Heaton worked as academic advisors to the creation of those, and they spent a lot of time and, and a lot of thoughtful work went into creating the indexes. And uh, we worked closely together uh, in the development of them, but uh, you know, they were ultimately the people that were the architects. And, um, and as I had anticipated, their, their high quality, uh, which was absolutely a requirement. We weren't going to uh, pay less to get lesser quality indexes. So, uh, so they worked out very well being very high quality, as high quality as you can find in the industry uh, mm -hmm. at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those interested, I mean, a few months ago, the Wall Street Journal had an article, right, on the uh, total stock market index fund, which is run through Chris, but they titled it the index that ate uh, Wall Street or something. So it's a great article about the history of CRISP and Vanguard and how the relationship has begun. But again, we, we owe that all to you. Thank you for that. Um, so another thing, which is a, a huge sort of uh, distinction that, that you created at Vanguard um, was that this notion that you could have ETFs, which, you know, back in the day when you did this, they were sort of a unknown quantity or sort of a new quantity to set up the ETF as a share class of sort of the mutual funds at Vanguard. And Vanguard now has, I don't know, 70 or, or whatever of them. And many of you may not know, Gus actually holds the patent for that. Uh, so maybe you could just speak about how you thought about doing it and uh, what was sort of the whole impetus there? You know, I guess we're all a product of our environment. And I started at Vanguard uh, October 5th, 1987. You might recall that two weeks later, October 19th, was known as the crash of 87, which was a scary situation to be running a, a small equity group at the time, and, uh, uh, and it left a mark on me. So I was always concerned about uh, the integrity of our funds. We, we had some outflows uh, during the crash of 87, and we had to go into the marketplace. The marketplace was frozen, but yet we had to execute trades to be able to fund the outflows. And, um, and, and uh, in the summer of 97, uh, let's just say the, the fall of 97, we had what was known as the Asian contagion. Mm -hmm. uh, the summer of 98, we had the Russian debt crisis. And I was just kind of having a flashback thinking, you know, like, geez, what if we had another crash like we did in 87? In 87, we only had a billion dollars in the funds. Uh, but by 97 or 98, uh, we had hundreds of billions of dollars. And if we had, let's say, 5% of the funds pull out, we've got we've to liquidate billions and billions of dollars. And so I started thinking about, well, how could we, how could we insulate the funds from that impact? And, um, and, and so I started thinking about, well, most of, of index providers or index investors are very long-term uh, investors. When, if you look at um, the holding periods of index investors, much longer than for actively managed funds, even, even Vanguard's actively managed funds. Uh, so the good news is we've got long-term investors, but the, the bad news is there are some that probably aren't so long-term. So I was trying to think of a way that we could, we could get those people who wouldn't be so long-term out of the funds without impacting the funds. And so, th and, and that's really what um, these, started me thinking about, well, if we had another uh, share class of the same fund, mm -hmm. but it trades on the exchange, uh, same, same fund, it just comes into the, into the fund through a different door and, and leaves through a different door. Uh, 
Uh, but the beauty was that it, since it traded on an exchange, it had absolutely no impact to our fund. And, uh, and that's really what, what the genesis, genesis was to, to create it. It took us a couple of years to get it through the SEC because we were going to put it on what was then the world's largest fund, our S&P 500 index fund. And it, it took me nine months of thinking about it because I feel like the world's largest. I think the other in the same boat. So it took them a long time to approve it. Uh, but we finally got it through and, and uh, so, and then subsequently got some patents on it. Yeah, and so um, a couple of questions. So one, some people may not know, but back in the day, Vanguard was not a big fan of ETFs, right? And and so did this sort of change their whole perspective on it? Well, Jack Bogle was not a fan of, of <laughs> Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, was not a fan of ETFs. Uh, uh, Nate Most was probably the, the man known as the godfather of ETFs, and he came into Vanguard twice, and Jack kicked him out of his office twice. <laughs> Um, you know, that's going back to the late 80s and early 90s. And then subsequently, he went to SSGA, State Street Global Advisors, and, and they started the first ETF, the Spider contract. Um, so Jack really, really hated the, the concept of ETFs. His, his view was, uh, if you create a trading instrument, people will trade it. And that was antithetical to what we were trying to accomplish with one of long-term investors. Uh, my, my view is a, a little bit different. I, I felt we should have... Um, an avenue for investors to invest in the fund through the distribution channel that they wanted to invest through. So some investors only deal through a broker, and now this gave them a way to get into our funds uh, through the brokerage relationship. And uh, Jack always took a, a vacation to Lake Placid every year. Uh, it, it's uh, for the month of August, so he'd be gone for the whole month of August. We had worked on this for a couple of years inside Vanguard. Jack was retired, but he still had a, his research uh, center in in our offices, and. Uh, he came back and uh, uh, from his vacation, it came out in the press while he was on vacation that we were doing this. And we were about two years into it. We, we hadn't launched yet. And I, I remember uh, we had one building where we, most people at Vanguard have lunch and you can enter from the second floor or the first floor. I didn't realize he was over the balcony of the second floor. I, I went into the foyer down below and all of a sudden I heard Jack bellowing and Gus, what the hell is going on around here? <laughs> and uh, so I said, you know, welcome back, Jack. Uh, but yeah, the, Jack wasn't a, a big fan. And um, it, it took it took a little persuasion internally to to get people on board. But the, but our board was wildly in favor. Of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the results speak for itself. Right. I mean, it, it's crazy how well Vanguard has done. And it's honestly, if they hadn't done it, as you've said, the things could have been very, very different, particularly with the rise of, uh, you know, uh, iShares, uh, if you will. Um, so one of the questions on this, you know, the patent expires next year, right? Sort of actually less than a year in May of 2023. Uh, what do you think will happen at that point? Will that have a big impact? So, you know, I think it's an opportunity for existing funds, funds that want to be able to distribute. I, I look at ETFs as just a distribution channel. People say, oh, it's a new product. It's, it's not really a new product. It's a mutual fund that trades on an exchange. Um, but so to me, it's a different distribution channel. And if you have, let's say, an active fund that um, is 15 years old or 30 years old or whatever, uh, but you've really only had the mutual fund channel to go through, uh, this opens it up uh, to being able to, to trade on the exchange. And, you, and then basically any investor in America can have access to your fund. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it might be attractive to um, basically larger, uh, larger existing active funds. And uh, over the years, we did have uh, various fund groups uh, ask us about licensing them. And we, we got into discussions with, um, with several different uh, possibilities, but uh, nothing ever came of it. So it'll be interesting to see if now that, you know, the, the patent expires, if, if there will be people pursuing that route. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing happening in that space is uh, some funds, uh, including dimensional, I mean, converting their mutual funds to ETF. Sort of what's sort of the impetus behind that? Uh, you know, I think it's just, I think it's a distribution channel. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, there are a lot of people who really wouldn't go to a traditional mutual fund. If you have to go, you know, through the traditional route, they just don't want to do that. They, you know, if you're using, um, maybe you have investments with three, four or five different mutual funds. You, you may not want to have 
you know, five different mutual fund companies that you're, you're dealing with, you might want to deal with your, your broker that has access to all five of them and, and you get one consolidated statement. To, um, so it's, it's really an issue about distribution and, and maybe ease of administration for the mm -hmm. investor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we had one question from the audience uh, about indexes. You had, we had talked about, you know, Chris providing the index for Vanguard. The question is, I think the spirit is, or is there much distinction across indexes? So the, what distinguishes one index from another in your view? Well, uh, you know, so there, in my view, indexing is really investing in a total market. And I've actually gone back to some writings uh, at U Chicago because it was largely developed at the University of Chicago back in the 60s. And in looking at it, uh, the discussion was really about trying to get the market rate of return. It wasn't, you know, let's get the growth market, you know, the NASDAQ market or anything like that. It was get the market rate of return. So yeah, as a purist, I think that's what indexing is. It's, it's getting the, the broad market rate of return. And quite honestly, that's probably the easiest index to track because, you know, the broad market is what the broad market is. Uh, you have to you have to be able to keep on top of all the corporate actions, so it's not like you can just create the thing and then go to sleep. There's there's a lot of blocking and tackling every single day, but uh, but the the total market indexes will be quite similar, and in fact they provide very similar returns. Mm -hmm. The the ones that are are more differentiated are when they uh, try to cut up different segments of the marketplace. And the way I look at that is uh, my terminology. I would say that's a, a, a passive investing um, in an a passive way to actively invest. Um, in other words, you're taking an active bet on a segment of the market. You're mm -hmm. not you're not take, taking a bet just on the market. You're taking a bet mm -hmm. on, let's say, the, the large cap growth segment of the market or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. That's an active bet. Uh, you're betting against value stocks and you're betting against small cap stocks. Uh, it, but I view that as being passively implemented as opposed mm -hmm. to indexing. Slight like difference in, in terminology. And in fact, uh, DFA dimensional, they they call themselves passive managers. They don't call themselves indexers. Um, so, but that's where I think you really can get different differentiation because uh, how, how one person defines growth can be very different from the way another person defines growth. And, and interestingly, those aren't definitions that come out of academia. You can't really just say, you know, here's growth. I mean, we, we kind of think of, well, if, if earnings are growing fast, but that's a growth stock or, uh, but uh, but there's no hard and fast definition. And really the best way to, to tell if you've got a good index is if it actually tracks pretty well how active managers are doing in that space. So Morningstar pulls together uh, managers into the nine Morningstar style boxes and, uh, and you can see how your indexes track relative to the managers in those style boxes. The indexes typically outperform those managers on average, but because the indexes don't have costs, the managers do. But um, but that's really the, the gauge of a good a good index is is it really doing uh, what active managers have defined as these various investment styles? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a couple of questions that have come in about uh, indexing in general. Uh, one, let me ask the question relates to what you just said. Uh, will index funds continue to beat 80% of managed funds? Or should you look for the 20% who do beat index funds? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, so, you know, some people think the, the argument for indexing, and I think maybe the early arguments for indexing were efficient markets. And if, if markets are efficient, if everything's perfectly priced, it doesn't make sense to, to, to try to outperform the market because you could only outperform by luck. Um, you know, I, I, I believe markets are reasonably efficient, but, but not perfectly so by, by any stretch. And if, if that's the case, indexing still makes sense because, because outperformance is a zero-sum game. Investors in aggregate own the marketplace. So for one investor to outperform, another one has to underperform. But on average, they're going to get the market rate of return before any costs. Unfortunately, investors have costs and they're much larger than what, what you might think. Uh, in an actively managed fund, 1% would be low cost for an actively managed fund. And costs aren't just the fees you pay to the, the money manager, it's also transaction costs. Uh, so that puts a, 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 an actively managed fund at a pretty big disadvantage. And, and so you can look at how 
indexes perform relative to active managers with the same investment style. And you do see that um, in any given year, you know, maybe 55, 60% of active managers will underperform. But over time, if you look at a 10 year time frame, you know, 85, 90 or low 90s will underperform their investment style. So yes, I think, uh, I think the first part of that question, uh, indexes will beat most money managers, particularly the longer the time period, the greater that will be. Um, but, but should you look for active managers, uh, you know, hope springs eternal. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I was hired to develop the active quant business at, at Vanguard, and, and I probably suffer from the same overconfidence that every active manager does. Uh, you know, every active manager will tell you that they're going to beat the market, despite the fact that they may never have done so. Uh, but um, uh, if you can find great active managers, you know, maybe you can add 50 basis points a year. And if you're adding a half a percent a year over an extended time frame, that, that can make a difference in your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you also have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that it's not very easy to find those active managers. Uh, at Vanguard, we used external managers for our traditionally managed active funds. And so we had this investment committee that, that you referenced earlier, and we spent a lot of time trying to find uh, great active managers. It, it, we, had, we had a group of, I don't know, 100, 150 people who that's what they did all day long was looking for active managers. And we were fortunate to, I think, find a lot of great managers, but we also had some that we had to part ways with. So it's a, it's a difficult game. I think if you're trying to do so, I definitely make sure that you're, you're doing in low cost active management because high cost active management is just self-defeating. But, mm -hmm. but if you can find great active managers, it, it can enhance your return a little bit. I, but, but I think indexing is a great, I think of it as a foundation for a portfolio that you can build your overall portfolio on. Mm -hmm. uh, if, the core and explore type of approach, if you will, and, and for many people, 100% index is the right solution. But but you know, if you're if you're great at uh, finding managers, maybe 50% index and 50% active. Mm -hmm. So we have a question uh, that came in. Plus, uh, somebody had earlier sent it in as well. Sort of index funds causing corporate governance issues, which was you know because of the blocks being voted in ways that some people think are a conflict of interest or. You know what I mean? Like the uh, aggregators, the Black Rocks, Vanguards, and others have too much power, if you will, which was never the point, right? That was never the intention. So the question was sort of, what can we do about this? What reforms do you think are going to happen in that space? Yeah, so there were uh, probably starting a decade ago, there were some people that were uh, creating some assertions. Actually, one of them, um, Eric Posner, uh, who was a law professor at U Chicago. And you know, raising the question, I think in the early days, the question was the index uh, providers had so much ownership uh, in in every corporation, really, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that we could in exert influence on management to actually get them to not compete against each other, mm -hmm. and thereby raise their profits. You know, basically collude to not to not compete and and have greater profits. You know, the fallacy of that. Uh, argument is, while we, you know, maybe you can say, well, you can do that in the airline industry or in hotels or something. Um, but the, the problem is that we owned everything. And so uh, the other companies that weren't in those industries, they'd all be at a disadvantage. So if we tried to do that, um, you know, we'd be hurting 80% of our portfolio. So I, I think that early argument really kind of went by the wayside. I don't think anybody's resting on that one anymore. But 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 people are saying that, well, um, index managers uh, incentives are not aligned with the interests of the investors in the funds. The interesting thing there is that, I don't know why you would say index managers, uh, you know, index managers collectively between the big three, uh, State Street, BlackRock and, and Vanguard, um, you know, own, more than a quarter of, of the marketplace, I think. Um, so it's, it's a big block. But at the same time, about 85% of the marketplace is owned by institutional investors. You know, all the, the ultimate owner, the beneficial owner is perhaps an individual, mm 
but uh, but it's institutions in, in aggregate that are really determining what's going on. And so, you know, I don't know why you would necessarily single out index providers are, are creating uh, governance problems. It, it, it's more of a, if you're going down that, that avenue, you should be saying, well, institutional investors are creating that problem. But, but, but to take the other side of that, uh, because I don't think that's really the case, uh, the, the large indexers are, are very large. I mean, Vanguard has now has more than $8 trillion worth of assets. BlackRock's that big. State Street's not quite that big, but State Street's a big organization, and uh, SSGA, that is. Um, and they have a lot of money to devote to uh, governance. So we know that managers don't really invest in stocks, they rent stocks. I mean, the average holding period for an active fund is, is one year. Uh, an index fund holds for forever. Hmm. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to own a stock for a year, you really can't even change the governance of a, of a corporation. Uh, it, it, but if you own it for forever, we can go in and we talk to management. We spent a lot of money uh, and developed uh, principles that we thought were important. And our CEO would write a letter uh, every year to uh, all of our holdings and say, this is what we expect of you. And, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to vote against you. And you can go onto Vanguard's website. And I obviously, I know Vanguard, uh, but I'm sure that BlackRock and State Street and other, other large institutions as well uh, have their own programs where they are working with, with corporations. And if you go onto Vanguard's website, you can look up uh, corporate actions and how Vanguard votes those. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's, it's pretty aggressive. Uh, and a lot of times, they don't support shareholder proposals. You know, a lot of people think, well, if you don't support shareholder proposals, you know, you're, you're violating governance principles. Well, uh, I'd invite anyone to go on to Vanguard's website and, and check out. They they give it a very detailed explanation why they might not have supported a certain shareholder proposal. So sometimes they will will support it, but others say they won't. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're shirking their responsibility for, for corporate governance. So I think there's a lot more going on than than people really realize. So one of the things that uh, was, I think has sort of been trying to happen recently, Gus, is that like BlackRock, for example, is trying to give the voting rights back to the individual, right? As opposed to, you know what I mean? Like say, you know what, ultimately we're just aggregating it. So you think that that trend will sort of continue over time and a Vanguard would say, you know what, I'm just gonna figure out how to let the individual vote on their things uh, and not take that on as a corporate responsibility. I don't think Vanguard will go that way. I've I've been retired for ten years from from Vanguard, but um, but I'm still in touch with um, with management and a lot of friends there and and uh, the board of directors. And I don't think Vanguard will go that direction. I think Vanguard, uh, well, number one, I think Vanguard has a lot more resources to figure out appropriately how these things should be voted, as opposed to you know. Uh, I have a few individual stocks and I get these proxies and I'm saying, you know, like I happen to have gone through a gazillion proxies in my day at Vanguard, but, uh, um, you know, it's, you have to really think these things through rather, rather than just check a box. Uh, so I, I quite honestly think investors' interests are better served by having someone who's really devoting a lot of resources to understanding the, the various issues uh, than to just Turn it over to people who aren't following this thing on a day-to-day -day uh -huh. basis. I, I think Vanguard views it as its responsibility to make sure okay. it's doing the best thing for investors. Um, so I'd mentioned since you left Vanguard, you've been on a number of investment committees. Uh, so sort of how do you decide which one of those to take on and, and how active are you in those types of roles? It's interesting. I wanted to have a, a broad book of business when I when I started going into um, you know into these investment committees. And it, it just kind of happened to work out that way. I, you know, I, I ended up um, on the investment committee for a foundation and endowment. You mentioned the Australian retirement plan, FINRA. Uh, they were all very different and, and uh, had some different opportunities associated with PGA of America. That, that one has, you know, great perk to be able to go to the PGA championship and the Ryder Cup. Uh, but um, but they, they have a lot of similarities. But but each one has its own unique uh, aspects as well, partly due to the nature of just a different organization, but also due to the nature of the type of organization, whether it's an endowment or a foundation or, or FINRA. Um, so I, I really wanted to build my book of business that way and make sure that I wasn't just loading up on endowments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so uh, 
uh, I, my my book is uh, it, it is very diverse and, and uh, you know, none of the organizations are in the same uh, type of the world you know, area of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned that you're now CEO of a, of a new firm. Maybe you could say a little bit about what that space is and why you sort of decided to go into that. Yeah, so I have a friend um, that I know from my days on the, uh, the Dean's Council, and um, he was class of 93 MBA and 92 undergrad. He was in the 3-2 program. And um, he decided it was time to drag me out of retirement and uh, out of full-time retirement. And I just, I, I've considered myself semi-retired. Uh, and um, so we're co-founding a, a new social media firm that we call kind of the intersection of sports, uh, finance, and, uh, and, and social media. And we're, we still haven't launched yet. We're in the building phase. And, um, uh, but it's been interesting. I've never been a CEO before. I've been a CIO, uh, very different role. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's a different challenge, and that's probably why I agreed to do it. But uh, uh, it's, it's been interesting so far. There's, we've got a lot of wood to chop, though. Uh, so maybe you could just speak a little bit about what are sort of regulations around financial planning services for college athletes, um, and what does just the, the landscape look like? Yeah, so, uh, so I guess that's probably about the name, image, likeness uh, regulations that, that happened uh, a little over a year ago now. Uh, by way of background, um, for those who may not have been following it, uh, there were 25 different states that were going to change their rules that would allow uh, college athletes to uh, endorse products and be paid for endorsements. The NCAA had always prohibited that, but, but state laws were going to change, uh, enabling uh, certain athletes in, in those states to, to make money. Uh, the NCAA realized that that would put the athletes in, in the other states at a disadvantage. So, so last June, uh, the NCAA changed their rules, allowing athletes to be able to endorse products using their name, image, and likeness, uh, nil, um, nil characteristics. And um, uh, so, so the NCAA has rules that govern what they can do. Various states, I think it's 25 states now and maybe increasing, uh, have rules that you have to abide by if you happen to be in a college in that state. Uh, the various conferences have their rules and the various schools have their own policies. So you've got potentially four different layers of rules, regulations, and policies that you have to satisfy uh, as, as a college athlete in order to be able to uh, to accept this endorsement income, the overriding factor is that you have to provide a service that is of equal value to the amount of compensation you're getting. And that, you know, the rationale for the NCAA never wanting to do this before is they didn't want uh, schools to buy championships. They didn't want, you know, the boosters of various schools to basically pay the athletes under the counter mm -hmm. um, money to come to the school and, and play for the team. And, uh, you know, that was the big fear. Uh, so now, you know, they're still guarding against that by, by creating these regulations that there has to be appropriate value provided by the student athlete. And, but, but at the same time, I've spoken with, with some people who are overseeing this at various schools, and they're really concerned about it because the, one school told me that 50% of their athletes are doing deals that the school doesn't even know about. Wow. Yet the school could be sanctioned if the deal violates any of the rules or regulations. And uh, uh, so right now there's a big shakeout going on and it, you know, like it's, it, it's starting to find you know, some common ground, but, but it's still kind of the wild west out there. Hmm. Um, one question that came in was, given the career you had at Vanguard, what do you see as things that you learned there or skills that are now helping you in this new role? You, you know, I guess, the greatest thing at, at Vanguard that I love the most, well, no, the, the thing was that it was in the investment arena. And I, I love just thinking about the various things that I'd learned at the University of Chicago, literally in my investment classes, and being able to think about how that could apply to what we were trying to do. And, um, and so that was great. But at the same time, I, I loved building. And uh, I, my first job graduating from uh, from U Chicago was as a commercial real estate developer. 
for a couple of years. You know, I mentioned LaSalle Partners earlier on. And, um, you know, I just loved, that was literally physically building buildings. Uh, but, um, but then at Vanguard, I had the opportunity to basically build the equity team uh, in, uh, I mean, there was, there was one other person in the group when I, when I got there. And so uh, I, had, I had one person working with me uh, back then, and I, I had the opportunity to build it from scratch. And I, I just love that. And, and so, you know, I think that's helped me in trying to do what I'm trying to pursue now. Um, you know, maybe not accepting anything is, is uh, set in stone and trying to think, okay, what's a better way? I mean, like right now we're talking about social media. Well, a lot of social media is uh, done in a, in a very similar way. And we're trying to think, you know, is there a better way? You know, I, I, I get on social media and Next thing you know, you, you know, you, you got to go shave again. It's, uh, you know, like eight hours have passed. And I, you know, I, I don't really want to create a situation where, um, where we're really wasting people's time, that, that they have really a, um, a rich experience and can move on. And so, uh, you know, just being willing to try new things and, and you know, I would like to mention the ETFs at Vanguard. Uh, having the opportunity to just experiment and try new things. And, and now, you know, that's what I learned there that I'm trying to transport over. Um, and so one, uh, we had a question about indexes. So one of the big issues that's come up now is uh, with ESG and ESG, and is that something that you can measure? How do you think about measuring it? would love to get your thoughts on just the whole ESG space and where is that going with, uh, with indexing? Yeah, so there are there are as many ways to measure ESG as there are people who want to invest in ESG, and that's that's the difficulty of trying to create a fund around it, uh, because to one person ESG may mean you know no fossil fuels, to another it may mean you know some other industry that they just don't want to invest in, and it's hard to find common ground. I mean, you you end up with about ten companies that that probably are uh, acceptable to everybody. Um, but, you know, to me, it's a way to express your own um, personal and social goals. Um, is it a way to outperform it? What I am concerned about is people think, oh, well, you, you can do well by doing good. You can do well by doing good, but to think you can do better by doing good, I think is, is maybe a little bit um, uh, over exuberance. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see any reason why uh, an ESG portfolio should outperform a non-ESG portfolio. And I've had this debate with consultants. Uh, I had one in, with a firm in Australia that, that I do work for. And, um, you know, they're saying, well, you know, if, you're, if you um, follow ESG principles, then you'll grow faster and then you'll, uh, you'll, you'll have a better return. Uh, John Cochran, who, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, uh, Son-in-law of Gene Fama, and and you know, presumably going to be a Nobel Prize winner at some point in time, and was on the faculty at Chicago Booth, uh, um, now working at the Hoover Institute. Uh, I, I always remember John Cochran saying, like, why is that not already in the price? I mean, if it's true that an ESG firm will grow faster, why aren't you? Why is that not in the price? You, typically, growth stocks, you pay up for them, and so you know that doesn't mean it's going to have any better return. Uh, mm -hmm just because it's a, uh, it's, it, it may or may not have better growth prospects. So to me, it's fine to express your, um, you know, your social values, uh, however you should define them. And, you know, unfortunately, as I say, it's like there are so many def different definitions of it. But, uh, but I would say, you know, try to get some diversification across the marketplace. Don't uh, uh, be too narrow in your, your focus and, uh, and then probably don't expect excess returns. Mm -hmm. And would you be in favor of uh, sort of doing these mandatory ESG disclosures that companies, you know, that ACC is thinking about? Um, I, I think that's fine. I think it's a little bit difficult to really define it precisely and, and, and then follow it precisely. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think it's fine for companies to express, you know, here's where we are in certain things. I think you have to understand that different companies have different abilities to follow certain things. I mean, you know, to tell Exxon, you got to get out of the, uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbon business is going to be a, a difficult, mm -hmm. a difficult task. Uh, 
Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so people should just recognize some things are, are the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of questions that came in about the uh, current market environment. Uh, one is people can feel spooked in an environment where asset prices have come down, certainly from, you know, like December, and interest rates are up. And what's your advice to younger members of the audience who may not have had experience or historical knowledge of these kinds of things uh, ever happening? I'm trying to think of how many different cycles I've lived through. You know, like 73, <laughs> 74 was, was bad, 80, 82, uh, uh, the crash of 87, uh, the tech bubble, the GFC, you know, uh, kind of goes on and on. Uh, uh, if you, you know, if you're really too afraid to invest, you're, you're never going to get any returns. Um, I, I think you, you recognize that there, but in, it's a function of your time horizon too. If you're, if you're 30 years old, what do you really care about happens in the marketplace right now, you know, the market pullback, uh, what you really care about is where the market is 65 years from now, or when you're 65 years old. And, uh, uh, and if you look at an historical graph of the growth of a dollar, look at $1 invest in the S&P going back to, well, 1926. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you look at pullbacks there, and you don't even see them, you know, like the 73, 74 doesn't even show up. And, um, uh, you know, so I think you have to think long term. And if you're if you're not thinking long term, then you probably shouldn't be thinking about the stock market. If you're if you're saving to buy a car next year, it, the money shouldn't be in the stock market anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think you just have to tie your asset allocation to uh, to what your time horizon is, and then just recognize that if you want to get better than risk free returns, you got to take risk. I mean, the capital market line. Um, has a reason for being and uh, and just recognize that risk means ups and downs and and probably avoid the temptation to time the market uh you know I've, I've one investment committee i'm on somebody was saying you know this was a month ago it was, it, it, we're talking about you know well, market timing and i said you know like you know right now i think if we were market timing i'd be getting in not out <laughs> and uh, uh you know typically People invest by looking in the rearview mirror, not looking forward. And so uh, we, we're not we're not wired to be great market timers as, as human beings. And Dick Thaler, Richard Thaler, has written about that extensively. And, and you know all of the behavioral finance people at U Chicago have done that. So um, I, I would just recognize there are going to be ups and downs. But if you're investing for the long term, you're, you're probably best off to just stick with it. Yeah, and I guess that one thing that people probably don't understand is that the price of being invested has come down so much, right? I mean, did you ever expect that the cost of, you know, like investing in the S&P 500 would be what it is today? It's kind of incredible, right? Yeah, it's like like three basis points, two or three <laughs> basis points. You know, it, it, you know, if you don't think in basis points, that's two one hundredths of a percent. Um, you know, so it's, it's about as close to free as you can get. Yeah. And... Uh, so you can actually capture the market rate of return. Okay. Um, so uh, question was about when you do active investing, I mean, uh, if you think about that, what things other than just the financial metrics would you look at? Um, well, so I guess financial metrics would be, you know, profit, uh, cash flow, things like that, uh, EBITDA. Um, the, the one thing that, I, you know, I, I would consider those. I wouldn't, I'm not a technician. I really don't believe in that. You know, maybe technical stuff works if you're a day trader, but uh, I don't think it's a great way to invest long-term. Um, you know, if you're long-term investing, I, I think valuations are important. You know, I mentioned John Cochran's statement about, well, why is that not in the price? I, I, again, I think um, Richard Thaler's work might explain why some things are not in the price. I mean, we love stocks that are doing well and, and, uh, and you know, we know we're going to grow, uh, but are we paying too much for them? Mm. Who, on the other hand, we really don't like stocks that are under pressure and have declined a lot and their business is, is uh, deteriorating, uh, and, and, but maybe the price has gone too low on those. So um, to me, it's, it's comparing valuations against the, you know, the financial aspects of the company. And, and so you can buy some growth stocks, 
just don't overpay for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can buy some value stocks, some, some ugly stocks, and um, you know, you probably get some attractive prices. And we know historically that value stocks have outperformed growth stocks over very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some Chicago questions for you. Uh, one is that if you, uh, what, who was sort of your most influential mentor while you were in school? And then I'll just add to that more broadly, even as you started in your career, who have been people who have been influential to you as mentors? So in, in school, I never had what you might really consider a mentor, somebody who, uh, you know, I was a teacher's assistant for, uh, but I had a couple of professors that had a great impact on, on my life. Uh, one of them happened to be undergrad at Dartmouth. He went to the University of Chicago. He was a protege of Milton Friedman. Uh, he got his PhD uh, in economics at, at U Chicago and built the Dartmouth economics program after U Chicago, hmm. which is one of the reasons I wanted to go to U Chicago to get my MBA. Um, the other professor that, that jumps out at me is having a, a big impact on me was uh, uh, Bob Hamada, mm -hmm. who was one of your predecessors, mm -hmm. uh, former dean of the school, but um, was uh, the premier uh, professor in uh, corporate finance back in the late 70s at, at U Chicago, and uh, was just a, a wonderful teacher. And I had a couple of courses from him, and, and then subsequently had discussions with him when I got to Vanguard. And, and Hmm. You know, I've had more discussions with them since than I did did beforehand. But uh, those, both of those professors, had a profound impact on on my hmm. life. And what about at Vanguard or uh, other roles that you had? Who were people who influenced you? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say um, the two people there would be uh, Jack Bogle and Jack Brennan. Jack Bogle was the founder and, and former. CEO and chairman of, of Vanguard. Jack Brennan was actually the person who brought me to Vanguard. Uh, Jack and I were actually uh, same class uh, undergrad at Dartmouth and, and good friends at Dartmouth. And um, uh, we, we ran into each other at our 10th reunion at, at Dartmouth. And uh, uh, that's when I was working for the bank. And, and uh, a month later, I got a call from another guy saying, well, Jack Brennan told me to give you a call. And, and um, so, so Jack, is, uh, Jack Brennan's really he's been a mentor to me, despite the fact we're, we're the same age. I mean, we were, we, we are the same age. We were born on the same day. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we were kind of tied at the hip, but um, uh, Jack Bogle was, uh, you know, he was a thoughtful guy, uh, kind of a big ego, but uh, uh, you know, he, he changed the industry. He changed the money management industry, not just indexing, but he changed the money management industry around the world. Mm -hmm. the, the, you mentioned earlier how how much less expensive it is to invest today than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's a lot of it can be attributed to Jack Bogle in the creation of Vanguard. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's had to compete a bit against Vanguard, and so they've had to compete on price. Right. Uh, and, and but Jack had a lot of uh, interesting things that he thought about as well that I learned from in the very first week at Vanguard. He, he drilled into me. There's a difference between good money and bad money. You know, back in the day in the 80s, you thought, well, money's money. Let's get as much of it, you know, invested in our funds as possible. He's like, yeah, do we really want that money? I don't think it's going to be here next year. Uh, mm -hmm. So I learned a lot of lessons from, from mm -hmm. both, both Jacks. Uh, the other question about Chicago is you've sort of had a connection back to the school. You were on the, uh, the, the booth council. You've done guest lecturing. You've been executive in residence. What has that been like for you sort of coming back onto campus uh, as an alum? And I, I will add, uh, as a parent of a Booth uh, graduate. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you know, I, I just absolutely loved all of my experience uh, at, at Booth. Um, at the time, it was a GSB, but, uh, you know, I, I love the beauty of the school, the physical beauty of the school. Uh, the academic experience was just fantastic. Uh, I had great friends from, uh, from my college days, and then I had the opportunity to, to reconnect um, later, um, as you mentioned, both on... Uh, the Dean's Council, and then uh, as an executive in residence, which gave me the opportunity to actually, I was seated, uh, my, my office was John Heaton's office, and it was right in the center of the, of the uh, finance faculty. Yeah. So it was great. Richard Thaler's office was right next to me. Uh, Gene Fama uh, was right across the hall, and Lars Hansen was just down the hall. So like three Nobel Prize winners within, you know, putting distance of, 
mm-hmm. where I was. And, and so that was a lot of fun. But I, I, I got to, uh, to mentor students while I was there. I, I did some work on, on trying to create a, a financial education program for the NFL. Um, I just loved being back in an academic environment. And, and, and I've always just, I've loved every aspect of, I even loved Hyde Park. Um, so uh, it, it was all uh, great fun for me, both attending and then having great opportunities after uh, after attendance. Um, and as I mentioned, your, your son went to Booth and maybe you could just, could you speak a little to how his, if you saw him, the sort of courses he was doing, the things he was doing, how was that different from when you were, uh, you were at the GSP? Well, you know, the GSP was a great place for, for me at the time, but I think it's it's a far greater school today than it was when when I was there. And, and it, it was a phenomenal school back then, but I think it's much broader uh, in its offerings today. I mean, you've got the leadership classes that we didn't have back then, and you know, and, and they're fantastic. Uh, yeah, I think you're really much more broadly developed today than than what we were back then. I mean, like we were all just finance uh, uh, majors. And, uh, and and now he participated in a program that's a dual program. He got both an MBA and a master's in computer sciences at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it was a great opportunity and, and really the perfect situation for him. And, and and quite honestly, I didn't have any role in his decision to go to the school. I, I was awfully glad that he made the right choice, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> but I was going to let him him decide that. And it worked out. Uh, he he really enjoyed it. He had a great time. Unfortunately, it was mm-hmm. uh, during the COVID years, so yeah. it was a, a muted experience. All right. So I'm going to ask you a macro question, which came in: uh, Can the inflation dragon be slayed without high unemployment? Without high unemployment. Um, well, you know the interesting thing right now. Obviously, rates were raised today, as everyone expected. And, um, and I think Jay Powell fielded a question, uh, are we in a recession now or do you think we will be? And, uh, you know, he pointed out that it's highly unlikely that you're in a recession when you've got, you know, 10 or 12 million uh, open uh, job openings and, uh, you know, unemployment rate, 3.6%. And, and I, I agree with that. Um, I, I, I think the toughest thing that we're dealing with now is um, wage inflation. Uh, you know, I think uh, the commodity prices have moderated uh, somewhat, uh, well, dramatically from where they were. Uh, but, um, but wage inflation uh, is going to be an issue, I think. And, and that's going to be a little bit more difficult to tame. And, and, and so I, I don't know that we're going to end up back at Seven percent unemployment. I don't think we're going back to, uh, you know, like 1982 to try to wring this out, but uh, but it could take us longer to get out of it than uh, than we might have been otherwise. I mean, you know, we got out of uh, inflation remarkably quickly uh, at back in the early 80s. I mean, remarkably qu- quickly. It was about a year and a half of, of a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to take a bit longer than that because it's really going into wages at this point in time. But I. But I don't think we're going to seven or eight percent unemployment. Hmm. Um, so we're kind of running uh, close to the end. Uh, so let me you one of the uh, the organizations I said you're uh, associated with is the PGA of America. Do you just speak about how that's been, and are you like a big golfer? Is that a, is that a passion of yours? Well, it, it, it used to be when I was younger, and then Vanguard kind of destroyed my game. <laughs> Uh, you know, we were not a, a golfing company, and I, I went from like a seven handicap to well, like right now. And if I break a hundred, it's a it's a good round. Uh, I, I did play golf with uh, some of the management of of uh, PGA one time, and that's the last time they've asked me to play. Uh, but uh, but but I do I do love golf, and I and I keep telling myself I want to take some time to to get out there and, and get my game back. But uh, you know, it hasn't gone too well so far. Uh, but this opportunity came up and I thought, you know, geez, uh, what a great way to be involved with the game and hopefully, you know, do my very small part to help further the game. And so it's been, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but, uh, yeah, my, my game, it, it, I, I'm not on the committee because of my game. <laughs> <laughs> I guess becoming CEO and I wasn't going to help it either, right? That, that'll be yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because we're sort of out of time. I just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and 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 also just to 
congratulate you on just such an amazing career that you've had and all the different impact you've had, not just on Vanguard, which has really changed, you know, investing as we know, uh, but on Chicago Booth and all the help you've done to Crisp and being on the school's uh, council and everything else. We are uh, incredibly fortunate to have you as an alum and we're just super grateful that uh, you've been willing to spend so much time with us. So thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. It's been um, so much fun. Uh, you know, if we have a hundred different paths we could go down if we started our life over again, I got I got the right path right off the bat. I mean, I, I've been so fortunate. So I've, I've, I've enjoyed my my relationship with the school. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for participating today. See you. Bye, guys. Bye now.